dietitians over at the Naval Hospital. I've uh, been in Okinawa a few months before that. I come from Naval Medical Center San Diego, but I had been stationed on mainland Japan before, so I'm happy to be back. I'm much happier to be in Okinawa than on mainland. Long story there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people are happier here, so it usually really is life. A um, little bit about myself. My background is a sports dietitian. That's my board certification. I used to work in private practice with professional athletes in my life before the Navy. Um, it sounds really glamorous, but it ended up being like this much politics and actually this much nutrition. So, yeah, it's pro the world of pro sports is entertainment. So, ended up uh, contracting with the airports for a little bit and then ended up joining the Navy. I come from an Army family, though, so I have a lot of love for Army. I just knew I was way too soft to ever do Army, so that's why I'm in the Navy. So, thank you for your service. Is somebody recording this? Yeah. Somebody recording this? Yeah, when, when I called up the Army recruiter, I could barely get to the first few sentences. I was like, oh, no, I can't, I can't do this. It's, it's all right. So, yeah, a lot of that. My father served for 24 years. My, my brother went to West Point, ended up serving eight years after that. So, definitely, yeah. A lot of love for the Army. So the objectives for today's class is to hopefully clear up some nutrition mythology. Because there's maybe no other area in the medical field that has as much mythology out there as nutrition. It's very confusing. Like, you open up a magazine, you'll read one thing that says something like, oh, omega-3s are the, the best for you. You're going to live forever. You're going to have better workouts. And the next day, you read some other article. It's like, hey, is there going to give you cancer? I never have them. So it's very confusing. Um, and especially, we tend to flock to people who are very athletic. And we look at them in the gym and their performance, and they have high muscle mass and low body fat. And we want to emulate what they do. So we go up and like, hey, what are you doing? What supplements do you take? What are you eating? And we end up trying to copy that. And in reality, they're just extremely gifted people, very genetically, you know, endowed to have that kind of body type. And they could be eating just Twinkies and donuts and looking great, but that doesn't mean that they're living up to their potential. So that's kind of what I want. The biggest takeaway from today is, again, you can be eating crap still performing athletically well, but you're nowhere near your potential. And just because you might be better than everybody else around you, I don't want you to be there. I want you to be here. So it's about challenging yourself to say, how much better could I be doing if I ate well? Um, so many athletes that I work with through the years, you know, they're on the covers of magazines. They break world records. And I say, OK, we tend to think of these people as healthy. You go out to a Raha Beach, and you can't see someone who's high muscle mass, low body fat. We assume that person is healthy. But I have a lot of my clients get some blood work done. I'm like, dude, you look like a very thick 95-year-old drug addict. What's going on in the inside of your body? So again, a lot of times in the lab work, there are other measures of your health than just how you look. Is everybody with me on that? Oh. OK, so we're going to, the whole goal for today is we're going to understand what, besides the Army and the Navy and the DOD caring about our weight standards, what are the other health reasons why we care about being overweight and being obese? I want you guys to sort of understand your know, different food groups and portion size and basics of that. If you're interested in weight loss, I want you to understand what a safe amount of weight is to lose weekly because, yeah, those that when they say, like, lose 20 pounds in 20 days, yeah, those are not always the safest things. So I want you to understand the safety of this. And I want you to be able to leave here today with a couple really tangible goals of some things like, hey, what are a couple things I might want to work on over the next few weeks after coming to this class to improve the quality of my food and help me reach my nutrition goals? So we've heard that word obesity before. Anybody want to be brave and take a stab at how do we measure obesity? You've got that 32 on your above on your BMI. So BMI, yes. What does that stand for? Body mass index, right? What, so what exactly is BMI measuring? A lot, a lot of people think it's body fat. It's, it's weight. It's a ratio of just height and weight, OK? So all that BMI is is a really inexpensive way of trying to assess somebody's risk for health concerns based on a ratio of their height and their weight. And we have that you know, ranges in value that there is. These are normal weight, below weight, overweight, obesity. So again, being obese just means that you're high on the BMI chart, likely to have some other health risks. But again, I could have two people that are 5'10 and weigh 220 pounds and look completely different, right? Mm -hmm. One person could be jacked and big muscly, and the other person could be a couch potato, never gone to the gym, never lifted a weight in his life. 
So again, they can have the same BMI, but again, health factors are gonna be very different. So again, for very athletic, muscular populations, BMI is not telling us the full story. So again, more than one third of US adults are overweight now, and a lot of that has to do with how much money we're spending on food outside of the house. Over the last 20, 30 years, it's uh, much more common now for both caregivers, both parents in a house to be working. So whereas it used to be more common that one person was kind of home doing cooking, making meals for a family, if you have two parents in a household that are both out of the house working, a lot of families are looking to more convenient foods and they're getting more frozen things or in restaurants more often. And these restaurants are filling their foods with fat and sugar and salt, the things that taste the best. So on average, people are eating about 200 calories a day more than they did 10 years ago. So we've heard that word calorie before, right? If you had to explain to an eight-year-old what's a calorie, how would you explain that to a child? <laughs> Energy, yes, excellent. You guys are smart. So yeah, calories are not little demons that sneak into your closet and so your clothing tighter. It's not a calorie. Calories, energy. So gasoline is to a car, like calories are to us. One of the main reasons why we eat food is we're trying to give our bodies enough energy. So it's important to understand what calories are, right? So did you know that the majority of calories that you eat in a day just go to keeping you alive? Like if you were like laying in a coma, you would still be burning a ton of calories. You're burning a ton of calories right now, even though you're just sitting here. Your organs are always working, your heart, your brain, your kidney, your liver, your lungs. There's always something going on in your body and you're regulating your own body temperature. That's very, what we call metabolically demanding. You burn a lot of calories doing that. So huge chunk of your calories just go to keeping you alive. Then you have daily living, right? You get up, you move around, you take a shower, pour yourself coffee, just moving around, you burn a few extra hundred calories doing that, so you need that. On top of that, you have planned physical activity, or maybe you have a physically demanding job. Those are your total calorie needs for the day, partially based on your age and genetics and gender. You know, There's a lot of different factors that go into somebody's calorie needs. Obviously, like a teenage kid is gonna need a ton of calories because they're still growing, right? So at different points of your life, you need different calories. So I, I'd like everybody to really understand how this works because it's a really important part of weight management. If every day on average, I'm eating about as many calories as I need and I'm burning that off, I kind of equal out to zero. What comes in gets burnt off. Is everybody with me on that? If that happens, I do not gain weight and I do not lose weight. That's weight maintenance, okay? So a lot of people get very frustrated. They come to me and they say, you know, I've changed my diet up. I'm not eating any fast food. I'm eating super healthy, all sorts of dark leafy greens, lean proteins, other fruits and vegetables, and I'm not losing a pound. What's going on? And I say, well, the quality of the food that you're eating is really great. That's what prevents diseases. That's what keeps you from getting sick. Those are great things for recoveries from workout. But do you see how it doesn't really matter what the food is if it's equaling output to input, there's really no movement there. To, if we gain weight, it's because you start taking in extra calories above your needs, okay? So there's no one individual food that makes somebody gain weight. It's all together. If you take in a few extra hundred calories than what your body needs, think about it like getting like a bonus check, like a holiday check. You get a few extra hundred dollars in your paycheck, you're like, your body's like, oh, score, this is cool. I have some extra for a rainy day. And so extra calories above what your body needs get stored in fat mass, okay? Okay, so that's what those, a lot of those fat cells are, calories stored for a rainy day. Because your bodies have no idea what day and age you live in, okay? Our bodies are designed for hardship, primitive times where you don't always know where your next meal is coming from. So biologically, like from an evolutionary perspective, it was very helpful to be, if you had some extra food, to be able to, to hoard that as extra fat mass so that in times of famine, that you would be able to survive off of that. Okay, everybody with me on this? So for weight loss, it's typically people are eating and taking in you know, fewer calories than what their body needs. There's a deficit. So let's, it's kind of like, let's say somebody needed 2,000 calories a day and they're only eating 1,700 a day, right? It's kind of like if you owe $2,000 in rent and then uh, you went out drinking, you went gambling, and now you only have $1,700 to pay this rent, is your landlord gonna be cool about that? No, you're gonna be like, you have a deficit. You owe me 
$300. The body's kind of the same way. You have a certain amount of calories that you owe your body. If you're eating less than that, your body's got to make up that difference, right? Because it still has functions and things it needs to do. So it's like, oh, I got this. I have some fat stores on me that's like calorie stored for a rainy day. Why don't I burn that off and use that to make up the deficit of what I need, okay? So typically, calories in, calories out is weight maintenance. Extra calories above your need, weight gain. Taking in fewer calories than what your body needs, weight loss. Everybody with me on that? Yes. Question back. How do you figure out what it is that you need on a daily basis? So typically what I, and a lot of, has anybody here tried counting calories? Is it super fun and wonderful? No, you want to do it all the time? Yeah, it's like the worst days. thing ever. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Mm -hmm. So typically what I, what I teach my patients is, you know, as your dietitian, you tell me like about an average day of food for you, I just calculate it from my head. I, I can kind of see where you're at. But for you guys, it's about sort of, I want to be obsolete. I want you not to need me. I want you all to be your own dietitian. So it's about learning about what I call calorie density. So understanding what is higher calorie, what's lower calorie, being able to look at your food today and say, well, what are my average habits today? How can I make a choice tomorrow that is just lower calorie than what I'm doing today? If every day you go to Subway for lunch and you get a 12-inch sandwich with salami and cheese and a chipotle sauce, and let's throw some ranch on there and a soda and chips and say, okay, maybe I need to count out calories, but what choice can I make tomorrow from Subway that's gonna be lower in calories? Say, okay, instead of doing a 12-inch sandwich, what if you did a six-inch and then a salad with the double protein? Instead of the heavy Italian meats, you can do the lean ham, you can do the roast beef, you can do the jerky. Maybe we can do oil and vinegar dressing, or instead of the chipotle and the ranch, maybe just choose one. Maybe one day do cheese, the next day not do cheese. Maybe instead of the soda, you do a water. Maybe instead of the chips, you do a fruit. You know what I mean? You can start looking at your day-to-day, -day, write it down, what are my average habits, what can I choose tomorrow that's lower in calories. So that way, you can achieve weight loss without having to count the calories, and you kind of look at the whole day of food. The other reason why I don't like counting calories is that you can cheat yourself. So many times I've seen people, they're like, well, my calories work out. It doesn't matter that I had 700 calories of donuts and beer. I'm still in my, my calorie range for today. So if you start looking at it like that, I'm a dietitian. I can cheat. I know. <laughs> I got a running tally in my head of what I'm eating. I can make room for the Dunkin' Donuts. If you, if you learn how to do that, you, you're not looking and judging your food day by health, quality, and patterns the way I really want somebody assessing their health. The other thing about counting calories that I don't like is because it is super annoying, and maybe right now you have time to do that, but what happens when you deploy, or you're about to PCS, life gets in the way. You work for the Army. You have a million annoying things you do every single day. If you only know how to manage your weight by doing something else that's super annoying, the minute you get busy, all that goes out the window because it's so labor intensive. So I like to teach more just about kind of looking, hey, am I eating three meals a day? Am I eating two to three snacks a day? What Am I eating when I'm hungry? I want you to listen to your body. That's the other thing about counting calories that I don't like personally is I feel like people don't listen to their bodies. They say, oh, I'm hungry, but I've had enough in my calorie plan today. And that can lead to binging later on because you just get so hungry. So let's say some days you are a little bit more physically active than others. I want intuitive eating. If your body's actually hungry, I want you to be able to listen to that. So again, other reasons why I'm not a huge fan of the calorie counting because I think it drives away from that intuitive eating. But for my calorie counters out there, it's kind of brings me to my next question. Have you ever known someone, or maybe it was yourself, who calorie counted diligently and was having a super low calorie diet and never lost any weight? We see that happen all the time, right? So it's not just calories, is it? There's a couple other things going on that make weight management very challenging when people get so focused on the calories. So do you remember I talked about the calories you need just to be alive, like if you were laying in a coma or hospital? That's what we call your basal metabolic rate, fancy term, BMR, to keep you alive. And for most men, it's usually at least 12 to 1500 calories, maybe more. So if you're eating a super low calorie diet below your basic needs to be alive, your body gets incredibly stressed out and it thinks you're dying. Your body never likes weight loss because from the body's perspective, you're starving to death. It's never a good thing. So if you have a very drastic calorie deficit where you're eating too little, 
Your body has to take a moment and say, wow, are we dying here? Is there access to food? Maybe not. Let's slow your metabolism down. Let's hold on to weight because that means survival. Do you see where I'm going with this? So you're, anytime your body is stressed out, from physical stress, emotional stress, from eating too little, if you have poor sleep, that's a stress to your body. Your body doesn't know why you're not sleeping. It could be running from wolves, running from zombies, who knows? And so your body's response is always going to be slow down metabolism, let's hold on to fat to keep you alive. So stress management becomes a really important part of weight loss and getting enough good sleep, dealing with your work day as well and managing that stress. Because if, when you have emotional stress, you have physical responses, right? Blood pressure goes up, heart rate increases, people sweat, they get butterflies in their stomach, stress hormone response. It's that fight or flight response. Your body doesn't know why you're stressed. Have to be ready to kick some butt or run away. Did you have a question? Um, earlier you mentioned um, going below your calorie count and then goes into fat reserve. Is it true that it goes after muscle before it goes after fat? No, that's not exactly going to be true with that. When it goes to safe weight loss a week, typically when we monitor weight loss, we only want about a pound or two of weight loss a week because if you drastically do more than that, it's more like your body can only lose so much fat mass at a time, so it has to take it from somewhere else, and that's when we start losing muscle mass as well. So does that make sense? Is that if people are just losing weight too quickly, so maybe they're still above their basal metabolic rate, so they're in a weight loss mode, but if they're losing five, six pounds a week regularly, they're oftentimes losing a ton of muscle. I often see that in the hospital after major trauma and major accidents, is that have a patient, and if you've been a you know, had some sort of trauma, big car accidents, burns, big gastrointestinal surgeries, your body's going into hyperdrive mode for healing calorie needs get what we call hypermetabolic. So we gotta feed these patients. Sometimes I've had, you know, young Marines that I'm having like four or five thousand calories a day on a tube feed because I don't want their bodies to start kind of eating its own muscle mass because it's gonna start taking all the fat mass it can, it's gonna start taking the muscle away. Do you do you need to go over like keto or anything like that? Oh, the keto diet, yes. Let's, we're gonna talk about keto, excellent, yes. I love the keto diet. I don't love the keto diet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay, everybody with me on weight management and why it's challenging. Your body does the best when you trick it. When there's a slight calorie deficit, not a major one, it could be just a couple you know, snacks you cut back on in a day, because if there's a very slight calorie deficit, your body's like, oh, I guess I must have accidentally not got enough food today. It's okay, I can lose a little weight, I got this covered. Nothing super stressful is going on. So the more slowly somebody loses weight, the more likely it is that it stays off and becomes a permanent change, okay? Because part of that means if you're losing weight slowly, you're probably making choices that you can live with. Because anybody can follow an obnoxious diet plan for two months and lose weight, but do you want to eat that way forever? <laughs> Because a lot of people, their heads and their hearts don't match up when you think about their weight management goals. If you want your body to change forever, your habits have to change forever, okay? You're not working on, you know, a painting that you're going to spend months working on. You're going to just hang it up on the wall and admire it. That's what we call it a lifestyle change. If you're unhappy with your eating, you feel like you're on a diet, that can only last so long. So slowly losing weight means you're putting your body at risk, risk and you're making choices that you can live with. So why is healthy eating a challenge? Does anybody <coughs> identify with any of these? Which one? Money. Money? Time. Time. Yeah. Tastes worth the time. Which yes. one? Yes. Tastes worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it's not all about knowledge. Having all the great knowledge is wonderful. As a dietitian, the only advantage that I have is I can make a wonderful plan. Following through with the plan with the plan becomes as difficult for me as it is for anybody else. So it does take time. You gotta figure out something new, that's true. Money, how, has any of you ever gotten you know, super motivated for some new diet plan? You go to the farmer's market and you buy all sorts of weird looking green things and you go home and you're like, darn it, I spent $70 on produce this week, but okay, it's good for me. And then it was a crazy week at work and everything sat there and then rotted and you threw it out. <laughs> yeah, so does that happen sometimes where you get overly motivated by all the stuff that you have no idea what you're doing with and you're like oh man i spent all this money but healthy eating doesn't have to be expensive did you know that frozen foods are just as healthy as fresh foods 
Though if it's fruit or vegetables, if there's no other weird added sauces to it, they are just as healthy. So you can save a lot of money by doing frozen, even canned stuff. You can find stuff that is reduced sodium and rinse it before you use it. Again, there's a lot of other easy microwavable things out there. I lived in New York City for 10 years with such tiny kitchens. I never used my oven. That was like for shoe storage space. It's a true thing in New York. So I just had a microwave. Um, I'm also incredibly lazy. I dislike cooking. I dislike cleaning. So I microwave most of my own food. That's just because it's microwaved and easy doesn't mean that it's unhealthy for me, okay? It's about balance and it's about thinking. There's a lot of stuff you can do that's very simple. So again, in one-on-one appointments, we sort of go over what your food preferences are and work on a plan like that. If I were talking to a civilian population here, I might cite the organizational skills, but I'm talking to an active duty population. You would not be sitting here if you weren't already good with that, right? I bet you know what time you have to wake up tomorrow, who you have to yell at, who you have to get yelled at by. Like everything <laughs> is regimented here. So in Navy, we do something called plan of the day. Everything is planned out. You guys are good with that. Taste versus health. Are you eating something because you really like the way it tastes or because it's healthy for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Family dynamics. I can't stress that enough, okay? And you, if you're living alone right now and it's just you, you know, maybe that's fine, but someday it might not be just you in the house. I can't tell you how many of the sessions in my office have become marriage counseling sessions. Because when one person is ready to make a change in a relationship or in a household, if they haven't discussed that with everybody else, it can lead to some fights come home and it's Friday night and there's some big cheesy lasagna and fried food because that's your usual Friday night thing. And you're like, oh, hey, honey, here's your favorite food. You know I'm on a diet. I don't want to eat that. We, eat, we always eat this on a Friday night. Like then sometimes there are fights, especially if you have a, an, a spouse or significant other who is actually doing grocery shopping, who is preparing the food. So that's usually the first question I ask a patient. Say, are you doing your grocery shopping? No. Are you doing your food prep? No. Is the other person in the household willing to change? No. Say, how can I help you? <laughs> so these are the things you need to discuss. But also, you know, what if you know you're sitting down for dinner and you have some wonderful, beautiful grilled chicken salad, some little fat feta cheese, a whole wheat pita, and it looks great. But the rest of the family sitting at the table with pepperoni pizza. Like that's a little challenging when you're sitting there and everybody else has a pizza and you're with a stupid salad. <laughs> That's gonna make you feel bad. Or then dinner's over and you're like, okay, I ate, I didn't eat the pizza, I'm feeling reasonably full, we're gonna go watch Netflix right now, we're catching up on Game of Thrones because it's coming out soon. And then the rest of the family's like, oh, let's bring out the Oreos. Oh. Let's, let's crumble the Oreos on the blue sale oh, ice cream, yeah. this is a great idea. Yeah. And so you're sitting there and everybody else is making their own special ice cream sundae on the couch, Game of Thrones music playing, and you're like, I'm done with this. Or just going for the ice cream. So again, talking about this with your family members, whoever might be in the house with you, I can't play that up enough. It's extremely important because it's not realistic when people say, or you read those magazine articles, just throw out all the junk food in your house and just get rid of this. You might have a child that has higher calorie needs, that needs a lot of higher fat dairy foods or something like that. Different people have different needs in the household and you don't always want to feel like you're pushing what you're doing onto somebody else but there are ways that you can compromise and work together. So I do stress that. I'll come back to reward in a, a minute, but stress. A lot of people stress eat. So when they're stressed out about stuff, they end up overeating. But there's also a lot of people when they get stressed, they undereat as well. And they start to lose weight, they get headaches, they get dizzy. So you always, if you have a good strategy for eating, no matter what else is going on at work, you're always consistent with the food. So that's key. Reward. Has anybody ever heard the term emotional eating? What do you think of when you think of emotional eating? Yes, we typically think of like the Ben and Jerry's and the breakup and you know people dealing with life trauma. Like, trauma. But there's a whole spectrum of emotional eating. If you ever in your life have used food as a consolation prize, that's that's emotional eating. So have you ever had a day where you're like, well, this donut from Dunkin' Donuts here is the best part of my day because it's all downhill from here. Anytime you do that, you're like, yep, just going out for pizza because I'm gonna be stuck at work and we got this all this high pressure stuff coming up. If you have that as a you know as a reward, that's partially emotional eating. So we tend to go for a lot of these comfort foods when we've had a good day and a bad day. Do you notice that? 
It's like, oh, I had a bad day. I deserve this. Oh, I had a great day. I deserve this. So a lot of times we go to food for this emotional response because there are certain happy pleasure centers in your brain that light up when you eat food that is high in fat, that's high in sugar, and that's high in salt. Those are the things that are the rarest in, the, in nature that are key to survival. And that's why your body is wired to like these things. So occasionally I'll have people that are like, I never crave anything sweet or salty. And I'm like, and you keep telling yourself that. Like, a lot of that is biology. It's true that once you start eating healthier, you don't crave them as often. But I don't live in a world where I think just because I want to eat healthy that McDonald's fries stop tasting delicious. Mm. Like, that's a reality. <laughs> so it, again, it's about finding this middle ground there. So, this is the cycle of dieting. Has anybody ever lived this, knew someone who lived this? Like, let's say it's January 1st, they got to start their new diet plan, they maybe yeah. bought P90X or Beachbody or started some hit training. Yeah, and then they have this initial motivation, they lose the five pounds, they, you know, you're doing more pull-ups and stuff, and you're like, this is awesome, you get positive results. So let's say that was January 1st, and now it's getting close to mid-February. All the Valentine candy comes out. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it's like the St. Patrick's Day candy and drinking. And then the Easter candy. Like, candy starts rolling out, you know, mid-February there. And you're like, okay, I've been doing pretty well. I deserve a little treat. I deserve some Reese's or, some, you know, you have time to go into your boss's desk. We got the big bowl of M&M's and take a little handful. And then all that, you maybe you lost that 10 pounds, but maybe they came back and brought five pounds of friends with them. And yeah, you blame yourself, and you're like, oh man, but it becomes the best nutrition class ever. You regain your inspiration, and you start the wheel again. So I'm making another Game of Thrones reference. It's time to break the wheel. So if you haven't watched that show, you guys don't need to. Um, the reason why I do not like this is because it's a lot of starting and stopping. It's not good for your body, that weight cycling, the weight increase, the weight decrease, the weight increase. There's not consistency for your body. So the way to break this, I, and this, isn't, this is not science, this is just me, my opinion, doing this for a very long time. I hate the word motivation. I hate that word. I know the military likes that word, but here's why I dislike that word, because you could be motivated to do something, or you could not be motivated to do something. Healthy eating is about not motivation, in my opinion. It's about prioritization. Like for us, you know, we always scan these crazy watches or something. You gotta, you gotta go for a deployment. You gotta go to work early. It's somebody's birthday and you have to work. Or, you know, we all do these things all the time that's, that are really hard, that are really uncomfortable. And when that happens, none of you are motivating yourself to do that. It has to get done, right? It, you don't question it. It's a prioritization. So when healthy eating moves from being something that you're kind of motivating yourself to do to being something that is a true priority for you. It doesn't matter if there are ups and downs. You never fail because you keep going, okay? So the emotional part of this is the most important part. Because again, there's a lot of knowledge out there. Most people can get to a point after coming to some classes and learning, what is food that's better for me, but why can't I still follow through with that? It's not a knowledge deficit. It's just a lot of other emotional factors at play, and a lot of people underestimate how hard this journey can be emotionally. So I think it's important to really acknowledge that and to really think about why do you want to do this? And if it's just to to look good in some sort of outfit or those aren't lasting reasons to want to do this. If you look at it for your health and the longevity of your life, the quality of your life long term, being around for your kids, being around for each other, not getting sick. Because when you get sick, someone else is covering for you. A lot of things that you can do for your health, very powerful with food, and when you think about those reasons, it's a lot easier to keep that level of prioritization. So where do calories come from? These are our macronutrients. They're called macro because they're bigger. Micronutrients would be like plants, sterols, phenols, phytochemicals, antioxidants, things like that. So these are our sources of calories. We have carbs. Carbs are your main source of fuel, okay? Your brain runs on carbohydrates. It's not, a you know, protein is not a source of fuel. It's more for repair, recovery, and building blocks. Fat has a lot to do with other energy systems as well. It's a precursor to make a lot of hormones and other things going on with fat. Did you know that your body will choose a fuel to burn based on the level of intensity of your workout? You know that? 
So it's a, have you ever guys heard of a term called VO2 max? Yes. The maximum uh, percentage volume of oxygen consumption. So I'm Army Screen. I'm Air Force Marine, maybe they've never heard of it. Go Army. So if you've never heard of this, I'm actually going to talk about it in terms of heart rate because it correlates to heart rate, okay? So when you're breathing heavy, using a lot of oxygen, your heart's pumping, right? The higher intensity your workout, the more you are sweating, heart rate going, oxygen, your body is burning carbohydrate as fuel, okay? As blood, we have blood sugar or glycogen stores in the muscles going through stuff like that. Right now we're at rest because we're just sitting here. If I go for a walk, I'm still pretty much at rest. I'm burning fat as fuel if I'm at rest. And by fat as fuel, I'm not talking about like fat stores on my body, but there's other fats floating around, you know, triglycerides and things in the blood, okay? Labor intensive to burn that fat as fuel, so that's why you, you do it only when you're at rest. If you start to go for a jog, okay, and we're starting to bring your heart rate up a little bit, you start burning a little bit less fat, and you start burning a little bit more carbohydrate. And again, high intensity, higher carb, okay? So a lot of people that are on the keto diet, and I'll go more into that, it's a huge, you're hugely compromising your workouts, your ability to perform at a high level of physical activity because you are, you're not maxing out the, the storage of carbohydrates in your muscles. Your glycogen stores can only be maxed out with a higher carbohydrate diet. And then your body just simply doesn't have the fuel that it needs to perform at peak capacity, okay? So too much protein is not a good thing either. Protein is for recovery, but protein above your body's needs is just extra calories. So I know a lot of people that are on these super high protein diets are still gaining weight, remember? Because it's overall calories and what they're taking in. So your diet should be about half of it coming from carbohydrate, about a quarter of it coming from fat, and about a quarter of it coming from protein. Go to the next slide. When people usually freak out when I talk about carbs being about half of their diet, but remember, carb is not just bread and pasta. I'm literally talking about all of our fruits our starchy vegetables, we're talking about lactose, you know, so our dairy products have a sugar in them. But I'm technically talking about every vegetable under the sun, okay? I love it when people tell me I do a, they do a no-carb diet and I say, okay, what I have for breakfast? And they're like, I had this egg white scramble with some spinach and onions in it. And I say, well, what do you think spinach and onions are made out of? It's not a protein, it's not a fat, it's technically a carbohydrate, just very, very low carb, okay? So when I talk about half your diet coming from carbs, I'm including every fruit, every vegetable, starchy and non-starchy, our grains and things like that, and our dairy. So I also want people to remember that alcohol has calories, okay? And if you look at it, per gram, if we weigh it out, carbs and protein are the same. They're about four calories per gram. Fat is more calorie dense at nine calories per gram. And that makes sense why a little tablespoon of peanut butter is 100 calories but I can have a larger chicken breast for 100 calories, fat's more calorie dense. But alcohol is just on the heels of fat, okay? A lot of calories in alcohol. So I love it when people tell me, it's okay, I only drink vodka, there's no carbs in vodka. I say, well, do you think it's calorie free like water? <laughs> you have vodka? No, there, you know how many calories are in a shot of hard alcohol, that 1.5 to 8 ounces? They never list them, isn't that interesting? It's about 100 calories. So it doesn't so bad. I had a patient once. I had a patient once who was really frustrated. He wasn't losing any weight, and he's actually eating very diligently weekdays and weekends. And I said, "Well, what's going on with your alcohol?" And he goes, "You know, I feel like I have it really under control. I only go out and I drink on Friday nights and Saturday nights, and I only have three drinks on Friday night, and I only have three drinks on Saturday night." And it sounds, you know, okay. And I said, "Well, what are you drinking?" He said, "I have a Jack and Coke." And I said, "Well, think about this." What size is your, is it a tiny little eight ounce like to-go cup from a chow hall? No, it's not that that your soda's in, it's in a giant bar glass. So each drink could have two to 300 calories of soda in it. And then say we have 100 calories of you know, Jack Daniels in there, but is the bartender your buddy? Is it really a shot and a half or maybe it's double? So each drink could have about maybe 400 to 500 calories in the drink, depending on how big it is and how strong it is. So. That was about 2,000 to 3,000 calories that this individual was having over the course of a weekend. And I said, let me put this in terms uh, that you can understand. I said, sir, it's kind of like telling me I don't understand why I'm losing weight because I eat half of a cheesecake on Friday night and then I eat the other half on Saturday night. So what's going on? And again, that all the calorie deficit that he created during the week, all of his good habits, did go out the window with the alcohol consumption. 
typically, when people have that alcohol and they're having thousands of extra calories, they're not cutting back on any food. It's not like it takes the place of eating a meal. Sometimes you go out drinking and then you're super hungry. And then you're having all the chips and the nuts and things while you're out. And then you go home and eat everything you ever thought about eating. It doesn't count because you're drunk. And then you wake up. <laughs> and then maybe you're not hungry for breakfast or lunch or you overslept. You feel a little sick. But then what happens by the time dinner rolls around the next night? Typically people are super hungry. And then they end up overeating. So the habits that go along when you're drinking sometimes lead to overeating. And then blood sugar abnormalities. There's just a lot of things going on in the body. Your body's dealing with alcohol that it's not dealing with some other body processes. So I usually say if you have health goals, weight management goals, you know, other athletic goals, cutting back on your alcohol while you're working on a plan is a really great idea because you can fit it in, but you do have to treat it like a dessert. When people talk about a glass of red wine, it doesn't sound so bad saying, hey, I had a couple glasses of red wine at dinner a couple nights a week. But six ounces? You know, think, think about, go back to your little chow hall to go cup, that's eight ounces. So less than that six ounces of a red wine can be anywhere from 110 to 160 calories, depending on the wine. So having two of those, about 300 extra calories, it's like having all those extra cookies at dinner. So it doesn't sound weird to say that I had a couple glasses of red wine at dinner, but you're saying, oh, you know, I usually have, you know, a couple extra Oreos at dinner every night. It's the same thing calorie-wise, so you see how that can really hurt people's goals? So be wary. Um, also be wary of the chew highs here. If you're, if you're old enough to drink them, be aware, because they tend to be very high sugar, okay? And when you look at the can, and it will tell you the calories on it. Have you ever got a can of chew that says, oh, this only says it's, it's 110 calories. That's per 100 milliliter serving. And a can is usually 355 milliliters. So you have to multiply that by 3.5. They're not giving you the calories for the can, okay? So that 100 calories is not for the can. That's 3.5 <coughs> times that. So be very careful with the chew highs here. What if you throw up, though? <laughs> there are other issues going on. Going so this, you guys look a little young. You may not remember this, but years ago, maybe when you were in school, you learned about the food pyramid. Well, that was really confusing to people. So they got rid of the food pyramid and replaced it with the plate method. The plate method is a tool designed to help you if I'm having a meal, how should my meal be structured? What should be in it? And ideally, the balance is Half of your meal, half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. About a quarter of it, like a whole grain starch, about a quarter of it, a lean protein. And there is some room for healthy fats as accents. It could be a little butter, a little oil, stuff like that, not going overboard. Typically what I see is these guys are the main star and a fruit and vegetable is an accent. Our fruits and veggies are our disease fighters and our lowest calorie things. So we want to really bulk up our meals with those. But typically I see giant plates of rice and meat with some sweet sticky sauce and then maybe there's a couple peppers on there. Or again, you go back to Subway and you have a six or 12 inch sub with all this meat and cheese. So again, a lot of breads, grains and fats. And then there's a little lettuce, tomato and cucumber in there. So for a lot of people, it's about kind of readjusting this balance of thinking, what is the main part of what I'm eating? So when it comes to our starches and things like that, I'm not going to get into the, the exact specific portion size that everybody needs. You kind of go back to that plate method of saying, hey, is about a quarter of my plate a, a healthy starch here? But I want to talk about whole grains. Have you ever heard that term, a whole grain? Why would you eat a whole grain? What's the benefit? Anybody know? Uh, fiber. Yes, extra fiber and extra protein. So fiber is a special type of carbohydrate that aids the digestive process and makes it so that you're not constipated, that you can have regular bowel movements, helps uh, to lower cholesterol as well. So a lot of people are not having enough fiber in their diets because they're not seeking out these whole grains. There's a lot of white bread and white rice and regular pastas and white potatoes, all these things that have no fiber in them. So, and some people ask me, like, you know, I looked at a food label and I saw that the whole wheat bread and the white bread had the same calories. Why should I pick the wheat bread if it's the same calories as the white bread? I say, well, also look at that label, even though they've got the same calories, like brown rice and white rice or a whole wheat tortilla, white flour tortilla, 
those whole grain versions have a ton of fiber and a ton of protein in them. So that keeps you fuller for longer because protein is slow to digest and fiber is super slow to digest. So if I eat the white bread turkey sandwich, it might digest and I'm hungry an hour or 90 minutes later. But if I had it with 100% whole grain, that extra fiber, extra protein might keep me full for a lot longer. And that's the goal, right? The goal is to eat something and feel full. If you ate food and again, you're hungry an hour later, that meal didn't do its job. A meal should keep you full for at least four hours. If it's not doing that, you don't have a balanced meal. And that's, that's the number one thing that I see is people actually like a lot of healthy foods. They're just not balancing their meals well and it's a snacking that gets them. They're eating like these tiny little, they think it has to be a physically tiny portion all the time and then they're hungry for snacks all the time. So typically we make the meal a little bit bigger, let's add some more protein, we'll add some more starch to it, we'll do this so that you're actually full and a little snack is just that, something to tide you over. Beware of terms like multigrain, nutrigrain, seven grain, honey wheat, things like that, because that's marketing, that doesn't mean anything. You need to see something that says 100% whole wheat. Does anybody like whole wheat bread? If you, if you don't like it, here's a couple tips. Number one, try different brands. Just because you had one brand that was bad doesn't mean they're all bad. Did you have a question? I have a question about wheat specifically. My wife is celiac, so she can't eat okay. wheat. Do you have any uh, alternative that you uh, recommend? So for people who have either a gluten sensitivity, a gluten intolerance, or a gluten allergy, remember, wheat is just a type of grain. There are many other types of grains out there and they do have gluten-free breads and stuff like that. I gotta be honest, the gluten-free breads are not very tasty. So for my patients with celiac, I know it sounds weird, but it's much better. The gluten-free waffles are much tastier. Just make a sandwich using the gluten-free waffles or you can get a corn-based tortilla because those are gluten-free and do wraps like that or grill up like a quesadilla on both sides. So typically that's what I have my patients uh, with celiac do they'll focus more on other rices and potatoes and other grains. It's just the, the bread without the gluten is just kind of nasty. It, it's a little better if you grill it. So toast it first and then use a non-stick spray and like grill it with a sandwich and something else that will hide the flavor. But a lot of my patients do better when we just take the waffle and make a killer sandwich on the waffle and then, yeah. So sorry about that, it's tough with, uh, with the gluten stuff. So again, go back to 100% uh, whole grain breads. Try a different brand. Have you ever heard of white wheat? Mm -hmm. It's an albino grain, so it looks and feels like white bread. So some of them, like Sarah Lee has a, a bread out there at the commissary that's a mix of white wheat and other um, white flour, so it's got more fiber and more protein in it. But you may need to change up the texture. Like maybe you don't like wheat bread, but you like a whole grain English muffin. Or have you seen those bagel thins? at the commissary like those are, even if those aren't the whole grain but they still have a good texture because you're looking for the fiber and the protein there but let's say like even you're looking at brown rice or white rice anybody like brown rice power to you i dislike brown rice quite a bit i think it's also kind of nasty but if i change the texture of it i'm okay if i'm making a healthy fried rice stir fry it's totally different for me if i'm doing it in a soup i'm good Sometimes I just pretend it's like a pasta dish. I don't put marinara and some turkey sausage in there or something else. If I change the texture of the brown rice, I'm good. Same thing with, um, anybody like a whole wheat tortilla? Yeah. Good for you. I, I wish I could. I wish I could. I, I like a white flour tortilla. I even just like a corn tortilla, and that counts as a whole grain. So if I'm making some burritos or something, I say, okay, it's not the end of the world. Just make half of your grains 100% whole grain. Not everything has to be perfect. So I, I'll do the whole wheat bread, I'll do you know the brown rice, and I'll do oatmeal, but if I'm gonna have tortillas, I'm gonna have a white flour tortilla. And the world doesn't end, okay? A lot of people look at healthy eating like they're playing a video game, and they're going along collecting points, and then they hit something, and it's like, whoop, game over. It has to be perfect. There's no game over, okay? Good nutrition is about what are you doing 80% of the time. There's room for these things in there. Just pick a white flour tortilla that doesn't look like it could double as a carpet in your house. You know, take, take a smaller one and pair it with other things to digest slowly. Same thing, if you only like white rice, it's okay to have a dinner with white rice. Measure out a cup, cup and a half, pair it with other things that will help it to digest slowly. So a healthy protein, you can have some grilled ter teriyaki chicken, grilled peppers and onions, other stir fry. If you pair that, with something else, 
It doesn't do that thing where it digests really rapidly, spikes your blood sugar up, and your blood sugar drops, tricking you into feeling hungry again, okay? So the key is just don't do it by itself. Anybody like sweet potatoes here? Sweet potatoes, a lot of good nutrition, more than the white potatoes, so getting that in the mix can be very helpful. Did I see another question here? Uh, yeah, there's also brown, there's, besides brown rice, there's red rice and black rice. Too. Mm -hmm. And so yes, and especially wild rice. Oh, yeah, is, no, it, yeah, wild rice is super healthy. Wild rice and ground rice are going to have some of the most fiber and protein in them. Also, has anybody ever tried quinoa? Q-U-I-N-O-A. Quinoa, it looks like that Mediterranean pasta couscous. It's like it's like little balls. It looks and feels like a grain. Technically, it's a seed. You boil it up like you would rice, but a lot of people take try it, and then they're like, eh. Mm -hmm. But if I gave you a giant plate of plain macaroni, you'd probably be like, eh. You gotta dress it up, you gotta do something to it. So a couple, you can do with quinoa anything you would do with oatmeal. So sometimes I'll do it with a little cinnamon brown sugar, sliced fruit, and do a broccoli quinoa. Anything like a rice pilaf you can do. Um, my favorite is I call it pizza quinoa. So anything that you go on a pizza is going in a quinoa. Put some marinara sauce, some basil, oregano, to veggie toppings, and do it like that. Sometimes just melt some low-fat cheese on there and do like a mac and cheese old school style. So you can do things to quinoa that will make it better. People put it in chili as well, like a quinoa black bean chili. So if you do something with it, it's going to taste a lot better there. Anybody like beans and corn and peas? They all count as starches. You get a lot more bang for the buck. For bigger portions of your beans and your corn and your peas, you get more fiber and more protein than what you're doing with the pastas and what you're doing with the rices. So a lot of people, once they start moving away from just doing pasta and rice to some of those other things, they end up feeling a lot more satisfied with those as starches. Anybody like oatmeal? You don't lose any nutrition with the instant oatmeal, okay? So instant oatmeal is just pressed so that it absorbs the water faster. Especially good thing to put your frozen fruit into because that's cheaper and you're just going to microwave it anyways. So when it comes to fruit, fruit comes many different ways, right? It comes fresh, it comes dried, it comes frozen, and it comes in a can. Fruit is a sugar, so remember that. A lot of people, they start you know, trying to get off the candy and then they're just snacking on fruit all day long in gigantic portions. Still a lot of sugar for the system, so sometimes they have stomach upset from that. They still start craving a lot of sugar, so fruit is a wonderful accent, and we can have you know two to three pieces a day, and that's fine, but just be cautious that it's still a sugar, so it doesn't mean we want to go overboard on it. So we typically consider a serving to be like the size of a tennis ball. If it looks like it's one of those Japanese apples that's been working out, you know, that could be two to three servings of an apple. Think of like your, your normal-sized apple as a serving size. Um, when it comes to dried fruit, your portion's a lot smaller, usually just about a couple tablespoons. Why do you think dried fruit has a smaller portion than fresh That's fruit? The water content. Water content, yeah. Fruit's low calorie, it has a high water content. So if I start out with a piece of fruit that's this big, and then I squish it down because I dry it out, what's left is more calorie dense. It's not to say that you can't have dried fruit, but just be aware your physical portion is smaller. You guys seen the fruits in a fruit cup? Full half cup? Those are great, they can last at room temperature a long time. You get the ones that are not an extra syrup or extra sugar, and those are perfectly fine to have, okay? And again, frozen fruit, just as healthy as fresh, they'll defrost very quickly as well. Anybody like fruit juice? Yeah? What's our favorite fruit juice? Apples. Apple juice. Pineapple. Pineapple, so we have, we have, a, lot, we have a lot of juice fans here. <laughs> Juice is the biggest myth out there that it's healthy, okay? So let's say you grew, anybody from Florida? Okay, so let's say you grew your orange tree in Florida, you planted it as a kid, you do your military career, you come back, you're retiring there, you had a juicer, you pick this orange and you juice it Sunday morning. Sounds super healthy, right? This freshly squeezed orange juice, not coming from a weird farm that you know used lots of chemicals or weird things. When you drink that glass of juice, it is the same to your body as if you just had a glass of Coca-Cola. There's no difference. Liquid sugar is liquid sugar is liquid sugar, okay? And liquid sugar does not exist in nature. Most people do not sit down and eat eight to nine oranges, but it's very easy just to have the sugar of that in one juice. So a lot of people who get very overwhelmed with nutrition and thinking about where to start, look, are you drinking your calories? So sometimes I look at people, they're having a lot of juices 
a lot of sodas, a lot of sweet peas or other energy drinks or things that have a ton of sugar in them, yeah, it doesn't typically make you eat any less just because you're taking in hundreds of extra calories of a little bit of sugar. The more sweet you have, the more you crave, the more your appetite goes up and out of control. And unfortunately, it's the same for fake sugar too. So even if you're having Crystal Light and Neos and diet sodas and diet Snapple all day long, even though it may not be the exact calories, you're still turning your brain on and wiring it to want sugar, to want carbs, to increase your appetite. So a lot of people have difficult appetite control because basically every time they put a drink in their mouth, it's like having dessert. And that's when I... Have you ever heard somebody say that? <laughs> and so when somebody says, I don't like to taste the water, I say, well, what else are you drinking? And I look at what they're drinking and say, well, if everything else you're drinking is dessert, why would you like water? Of course not. But you build up a tolerance to sweet. So a buddy and I could go to the coffee shop and I could put one packet of Splenda or Equal or real sugar into my coffee and my buddy might put five. And it could taste the exact same to both of us. Just like alcohol, you build a tolerance, same thing happens with sweet stuff. So a lot of times people start having all these sweets and nothing tastes sweet anymore. Versus the first, you know, think about, has anybody ever tried one of those ultra low carb diets? And they go weeks and weeks without eating anything sweet. And then they have an apple and it's like, it's a gift from Mount Olympus. Oh my gosh, this is so sweet. Because you're sensitive to it. Because you are, you, and that's how you want to be, right? You want to be sensitive to having a piece of fruit and having that feel really sweet so that you're not always having to go to chocolate or to ice cream to get that kick of, hey, I want something sweet. So yeah, just be mindful of the juice. Because every day, if somebody just even had that little eight ounce cup of juice at breakfast and they decide to change it out for water, they're gonna lose 10 pounds a year without doing anything else, just by looking at what their beverages are. Does anybody like coffee? Yeah. You like coffee, you like coffee, running on coffee? Mm -hmm. What do we add to coffee? Sugar. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Then you actually, you actually like coffee if you don't wanna add anything to it. I have a lot of patients through the years that tell me they love coffee, but with all the cream and sugar they put in every cup, they literally turn every cup into the same nutritional equivalent as a donut. So it's like having three donuts in the morning when they have their three cups of coffee. I, and I dare to tell them, I don't think you like coffee. And then they get offended and they say, no, I really think you like normal flavored sugar, which is delicious, don't get me wrong, but it's very different than just liking coffee. So again, if you only like certain drinks because you have to make them very sweet, you probably do not like that drink. And you might need to think of a different way, you know, or brew a lighter roast rather than a really bold roast and think about what you're adding to it because over time, you could become accustomed to having coffee not as sweet. Um, when it comes to dairy, dairy is healthy because it's got the calcium and vitamin D, right? But dairy packs the same fat as red meat, okay? So cheese, whole milk, cream, half and half, Alfredo sauces, creamy salad dressings, full fat yogurt, these heavy dairy-based things have the same saturated artery-clogging fats as our butter and our bacon and our lard and ribeye steaks. So a lot of people become vegetarians because they're trying to do something good for their heart health and then their cholesterol just shoots up. And I'm like, well, how much cheese are you putting on everything? It's the same as having steak on with every meal. It's How's almond milk? So mm -hmm. almond milk is way healthier than regular milk. Mm -hmm. Interesting thought. It doesn't have blood or pus in it. So, so almond milk, well, but here's the question. If, if, you, hold, if you hold a, a thing of almonds in your hand, where is that juice coming from? Exactly. They, they, they press it somehow to make it milky and they add like a little bit of wood into it. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that's 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 it's a, there's a difference between a food and a food, food product, right? So almond milk is a food product. There's no like juice or wetness in an almond. If you crush it up, it's almond powder, right? Mm -hmm. You're basically just doing that with water and putting some other flavoring in it, and then they're fortifying it with the same calcium and vitamin D as cow's milk. So if you're looking for a substitute of saying, I'd like the same vitamin profile, it's perfectly acceptable, it's not harmful to have almond milk. I don't find that there's anything in there that's gonna harm somebody but it also doesn't have a lot of protein in it. So people don't often feel as full if they put it in a smoothie or something, if they did cow's milk or soy milk, 
that's chock full of much more protein. So it can be a good substitute if you're looking just for something like, hey, what do I want to put in my milk and I just don't feel well with dairy, it hurts my stomach. So if dairy milk hurts your stomach, you can get the lactose free milk, you can do almond milk, you can do soy milk, rice milk, there are alternatives. They're all fortified with the same nutritional profile of the vitamins, but remember, it's the cow's milk and the soy milk that are packed with the protein. Did I see another question? I just, my yes. question is comparing the milk to the correct milk. Similar, it's gonna, they're all gonna be in, in a similar category with not as much protein in it. So again, I'm not saying that one is gonna be necessarily healthier than the other, but for people who are looking to eat super naturally, I wouldn't even include any of these because no one, when you look at it like that, like dairy, who should have dairy? Yeah, a baby, baby cow <laughs> or an infant. So for people who like, are get obsessed with wanting to eat very naturally, I'd say, well, probably shouldn't be doing much dairy anyways, but because it does pack so many benefits, it's good to keep it in the diet, but it is important to be picky about the dairy that you have. So for milks, fat-free milk, 1% milk are much better choices. If you're looking at cheese, to do a reduced fat or light cheese instead of a full fat cheese. If you rarely do cheese, you know, once or twice a week, you have a piece and a sandwich, it's not a big deal to do the full fat variety. But if you want cheese every day and you're cooking with it, putting it in a scramble, making your own turkey burgers, doing like the, the cheese stick as a snack, you just need to choose the reduced fat kind. Mm -hmm. To be honest, fat-free cheese is very disgusting. So I don't it's recommend anybody revolting. eat. Yeah, it's revolting. Oh, oh, All but, cheese is revolting, egg. What? Yeah. But doing a reduced fat one will still have good flavor and it will still melt. Same thing with yogurt. Just cho choosing a light or reduced fat yogurt is gonna help promote good heart health because those saturated fats from animal products that we'll talk about in a second, those are pro-inflammatory. So heart disease is a big concern, but also looking at systemic inflammation, other medical conditions, and also for your workouts, right? You wanna reduce any sort of inflammation. So even if heart health is not on your mind right now, there are athletic benefits to cutting back on those saturated fats, okay? So yeah, you can see a big difference in the calories of the whole milk, 2%, 1% fat-free milk. If you have children, well, our recommendation is, is that after age two, if there's no other medical conditions going on, we like for children to be on 1% in fat-free milk. That's our recommendation, to get them used to that as adults so that they're not always having the higher fat milk in their diet. This is, again, nutritionally equivalent. So when it comes to these non-starchy vegetables, if it's not corn or peas or potatoes, this should make up the bulk of your diet, okay? because these are the lowest calorie ones and these are the col and the more colors the better. I say again, if you're overwhelmed at learning, you know, where should I start with all this nutrition stuff? You know, look at what you're drinking, but then the second bowl say, am I eating something of every different color today? I wish that Fruity Pebbles would count, but they don't. <laughs> so, what did I eat that was red? Okay, did I have a red pepper? What did I eat that was green? I had some spinach or I had some broccoli. What did I eat that was yellow? Did I have a banana or a yellow squash? You know, especially looking at the different colors for these non-starchy vegetables, each different color offers different benefits nutritionally. So if they're frozen, that's okay. If they're canned, that's okay. And canned, look for the reduced sodium. Anybody do the steamer bags in the microwave? Things like that. Yeah, they can be very, very convenient. Um, another fun thing to do with that is cook them until they're mostly done in the microwave, like 90%, and then finish on the skillet in a stove top with some of that nonstick spray or a little oil because it will cook out that last bit of moisture. Makes them taste extremely fresh, and then you can add seasonings or a sauce or other proteins that you wanted to add to that. It can make it taste much <coughs> better than just putting it out of the bag frozen without anything on it. There's some really cool things hiding in the frozen section here. Have you seen the frozen lentil zucchini pasta bags? Yeah, Birdseye makes those. There's a plain one, there's a marinara one, and there's a cheese one. My husband really likes the cheese one. I think it's gross. I'd rather just put my own cheese on it. But it looks, tastes, and feels like pasta. Like, I, again, I'm, I'm a very, very picky southern farmer, so I test all my food on him and see what he notices. And when I made this for him, he had no idea that it wasn't regular pasta and was super excited that I gave him a giant bowl of pasta because I never do that. <laughs> but it ta it's just made of lentils and zucchini and egg whites. So you just frozen, put the whole thing in the microwave, and they're great to add to stir fries or other things. There's also some really cool frozen cauliflower stuff out there. Have you played around with any of those? There's cauliflower mashed potatoes. There's plain and a ranch flavored one. Um, my favorite one lately that I've been making is the riced cauliflower. Have you seen that? It's a bag and it's got cauliflower that's been cut to the size of little rice grains. There's some peas and carrots and onions in there, so I use it to make like a healthy breakfast rice. 
And so you can have a whole bag. It's so few calories there. Has anybody ever had the cauliflower tater tots? If you haven't, you gotta try this. They make broccoli tater tots too. So just, yes, they're fried, but it's a cauliflower, not potato, so it is way fewer calories than if you were doing a fried potato. So you can bake those up, and it's kind of a good hash brown substitute. It's great to have with breakfast. Do you have a question? So potatoes are a vegetable, though. They are a vegetable, but they're, vegetable. but they're starchy. So you just have to put them in that category of acting like bread and rice and pasta. So sometimes I have people that they're only, they'll say, what are, what are you doing for dinner? And then there's bread and there's pasta. And they say, oh, my vegetables are peas and corn and potatoes. And it's a giant carb load. So you have to take the, the, the pasta, the rice, and those starchy vegetables and kind of treat them the same way with the balance and focus more on all your other vegetables that are less starchy because they're packed with fewer calories so you can fill up on them more. Does that make sense? So not that we have to give up potatoes, but it's just about moderating them. And if you can keep the skin on, that's where you're going to get the fiber in the white potato there. So when it comes to protein, most people, go to the next slide, most people are eating way more than they need. The average 13-year-old girl that I work with is eating as much protein as a professional bodybuilder needs nowadays. It's very easy to get protein in your diet, and more is not always better there. But protein comes lean, it comes <coughs> medium fat, and it comes high fat. So again, our goal is to incorporate more of the leaner protein. So most of the time with poultry, the skin is going to be where the fat is. So taking off the skin and having the poultry without the skin most of the time is going to be helpful. Then you can get tuna. Tuna by itself is not bad for you. It's when we start having a ton of mayo and stuff in there that you, the tuna salad can nutritionally start looking like a heavy Italian meat there. So taking without the skin. Beef does not always have to be off of your diet if you're trying to eat healthy. You just have to pick out leaner beef, okay? If you're cooking with ground meat, at least 90% lean is going to be much better for you than going in the 80s and the 85s. Also hearing the word loin, like sirloin, tenderloin, that is going to be a buzzword for you to recognize something as lean. Pork tenderloin is extremely lean, much leaner for you than having you know, bacon and things like that. Um, turkey breast is also very, very lean. You can, you know, with the deli meats and stuff like that, again, avoiding the salami and things like that will be helpful. They do tend to be a bit salty, so if you have some heart health issues in your family, that might not always be the best go-to thing, but roast beef tends to be the lowest sodium of the deli meats there. Again, just be careful about cheeses because you can get the leaner versions. The white part of the egg is the big lean protein star. The yellow part has some fat in it. So one whole egg is about 70 calories, but I can get about six egg whites for 100 calories. Have you seen them in a carton? They come 100% liquid egg whites. So it's not, it doesn't have, not always the ones that have the yellow color added to it. It's a great lean protein. So if you're making a scramble and you used to have four or five eggs in there, you could say, well, maybe I'll do two whole eggs and then just pour in the rest of the egg whites. Gives yourself a huge portion to eat of just the leaner protein part, cutting back on the cholesterol and saturated fat there. And medium fat protein, salmon, has the, it does have those really heart healthy <clears throat> omega-3 fats, and that's why salmon is a fish you see a little bit higher calorie. The dark meat, uh, is going to be a little bit higher calorie for our poultry, not too much though. And again, certain cheeses are going to be a little bit heavier, some like the Gouda and Brie and things like that. And again, this seems pretty common sense, fried foods, full fat cheese, sausage, bacon, hot dogs, things like that. So I just would just say not that you have to give them up, but look at what am I doing most of the time? Am I choosing these really heavy proteins? Maybe I want to choose some leaner ones. Has anybody ever had, you know, I met, mentioned a couple times, like turkey sausage or chicken sausage? They're not bad substitutes. When you stop here, please take time to look at the frozen section. Because we're overseas, there are certain things that end up frozen in the commissary that normally would not be frozen stateside. Johnsonville has these really good chicken sausages. They're like big broths. There's one that has like artichoke in it and cheese, and this is a chicken apple sausage. But they come frozen, whereas stateside, I would normally get them fresh. Canadian bacon is very lean, like those little lean cuts of ham. Those I find frozen here too, near the bacon. Has anybody ever had turkey bacon? <coughs> How do we feel about turkey bacon? Oh, it doesn't replace bacon. It doesn't replace bacon, that's the key. It's to realize that it doesn't, but it's a really good replacement for a bacon bit. Yeah. So especially if I microwave it, it gets crunchy and you can crumble it on a salad or on a baked potato. So if you cook it in a pan, it tastes a lot better than if you cook it in a microwave. So it can be a great thing to add to the rotation. 
but it's not the perfect substitute for bacon. So you can say, hey, maybe a couple times a, you know, of the month I'll do some real bacon, I'll try to do some turkey sausage, turkey bacon for the other times of the month. So fats and oils. We talked about some of the good fats, when we talked about some of the bad fats. Typically the good fats are coming from plants. Nuts and seeds and nut butters, like peanut butter, almond butter, sesame seeds, canola oil, olive oil, avocado, fish like salmon, sardines, herring, anchovies, specific oysters for the omega-3s, and typically the artery-clogging saturated fats are coming from animals. So the skin of poultry, the yellow part of an egg, the marbling in the red meat, and then the high-fat dairy like butter and creamy things like that. That's usually the rule of thumb. Plant good, animal not so good. There's an exception to this. It's a trivia question. Can you think of a plant that I haven't mentioned today yet that is actually a source of a saturated fat and acts like butter and bacon. Avocado. Avocado is very good for you. Coconut. Coconut, yes. Who's yeah. like coconut? <laughs> right, yes. It's about coconut milk. And I'm talking about coconut oil. Coconut oil is worse for you than butter. It has more saturated fat than butter. The coconut industry has a vested interest in a lot of marketing to make you think that this is healthy. I have never, ever seen convincing research to show me that this is healthy in any way, shape, or form. But it's not poisonous, okay? I'm not saying to never have it, but I don't want people thinking it's a magic fat that they need to start throwing in everything. A little bit for flavor is fine, just like adding a little bit of butter for flavor. There's nothing wrong with it. But at the same time, be wary, this is not a healthy thing. And it masquerades as a healthy fat. You go to over to the gym, over to anybody, and I bet they're going to tell you, yep, coconut is super healthy, very high calorie, especially a lot of Thai dishes and curry dishes that have heavy coconut milk in the sauce. It's kind of like having a butter soup. So a lot of times people are not aware when they start having a lot of Thai food and curry that's heavy with some of these coconut seasonings in it, why they start gaining weight. The Okinawa <laughs> team, as I call it, I'm like, well, how much sushi and how much stuff are you going out to eat? Well, yeah. Yeah, you, so my girlfriend made me like this Thai curry, and I cooked it, mm -hmm. and like, the whole top layer was just oil. That's all it was. Did you have to add a lot of coconut to it? Oh no, it was like it was already it was already out. It was a pre prepared curry. Oh yeah. Right? So I just had to like scoop all that oil out. Yes. Some of them just end especially pre prepared stuff like that can end up being very greasy. Um I'm actually going out for sushi here. Anybody like sushi? Like sushi? Sushi's good. Um just be again, be aware. Did you know that the rice vinegar that they add to sushi rice has sugar in it? That's what makes it taste so good. So it's typically this much rice that gets pressed to like this size with added sugar to it. So again, it can be a very high calorie, high sugar load when you go to the sushi go around and you have 10 plates of sushi. You can go very quickly. Just, so yeah. Just, 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 just. So especially like, like the Sane market across the street, it's like the big yellow sign with the three red triangles that looks like it could be some sort of Klingon sign. It's a great, great market, but you can buy the giant plate. Sorry, big Star Trek fans here. Um, so you can buy the giant plate of sashimi. So a lot of times it's not that you're giving up eating local food, but you're saying, hey, if I really just want the fish on this, it's good. Or my favorite thing to recommend before you go out to eat in Okinawa, pregame. And I'm not talking about drinking, I'm talking about eating. Okay? But, it's the same con but it's the same concept. Why do people bring in for alcohol? It was food you can eat before you go out. You do not have to go out to eat to satiate your hunger. If you All the time I see people know they're going out for sushi, so they're purposely not eating during the day. Because like, I want to you know, really enjoy it. I want to spend all my money, and I want to get my money's worth and eat a lot. And they end up overeating so much, an incredible amount, more so than had they kind of eaten normal portions throughout the day. Like sushi doesn't go away. It's not your last time ever that you're gonna eat sushi. So if you have a big salad with some vegetables and grilled chicken and you go out and you can enjoy some plates of sushi, it's not a big deal. Especially if you say, okay, how many plates do I wanna have with the rice? And then maybe I can just start picking off the fish or a little piece of tempura from the other one. Back on mainland, I was friends with uh, my Japanese realtor. I used to go to the sushi ground with him and be so embarrassed because I would eat off all the fish and I would leave the little blocks and I used to make little capsules out of them on my plate because they were like these wonderful little blocks. And 
he just thought that was the weirdest thing ever that somebody would do to not eat the rice there. But I said, you know what? I'm, I don't need, I'm not here for all the rice. I have a couple plates with rice and fish, and I really like the fish and the toppings. So, and there can be a balance in going out to eat and enjoying the local food here in Okinawa. Because fat is more calorie dense, you do have to be aware of the portion. A tablespoon of an oil or butter is about 120 calories, okay? So sometimes when people are cooking with this and they're drowning a quarter cup of oil for all their vegetables, again, it could be hundreds of extra calories. So usually, you know, a tablespoon is fine if you're sharing with a family. If it's just you, maybe you need like a teaspoon and a half. A little goes a long way. Especially if you put it, your favorite oil in like a spray bottle and you can make your own misting spray on a spray pan so that you don't end up using too much of it. Sesame oil and peanut oil are extremely flavorful, like chili oil as well. So it doesn't always just have to be canola oil or olive oil, okay? So I'm going to use this time to talk about the keto diet. I know it kind of takes us off traffic a little bit here, but I think it's a really important thing to discuss about fats and all of that. So we've heard of the keto diet. Okay. So the process of ketosis is a process that your body goes through when you're dying and starving to death, and your body's trying really, really hard to not let you die, okay? So typically, when there's no access to any carbohydrate, your body starts to get extremely worried about this because your brain runs on glucose, your brain runs on <coughs> sugar, it is a vital fuel source. So what your body can do is it's starving to death, and it's starting to oxidize some of its own body fat stores. It can take fat, and make something called the ketone body that's a source of fuel for your brain. It can cross the blood brain barrier, go into the brain, and that is the process of going into ketosis, okay? Your body's starting to make ketones to keep you alive and functioning so that hopefully you can find a carbohydrate. It's biding time for you to find a carbohydrate, okay? Now the jury's not out. We know that the body is meant to function with about 30 to 20, range of 25 to 35% of your diet coming from fat. Even if it's all healthy fats, more than that is not good for your heart. So there's no medical judgment out there that says, well, maybe it's better to do more fats. No, it's not better to do more fats. A lot of people like doing keto because it's effective for weight loss. There are a lot of things that are effective for weight loss that are not necessarily healthy for you, okay? Like having a parasite. <laughs> like getting mono. Like having a disease like cholera or malaria. A lot of people lose weight. Their blood sugar, if they were pre-diabetic, their blood sugar is going to get better. If they had high cholesterol, those diseases usually cause a dip in cholesterol too. So there can be a lot of very effective things for weight loss that are not necessarily healthy, okay? And a lot of people find it easier to maintain because they're avoiding carbs altogether so they don't have the cravings for carbs, okay? So they tend to eat more of the fat, which is very filling, so they're not having these up and down cravings, okay? The hard thing about going into ketosis, and I've done it myself, as a dietitian, I try everything. I try gluten-free eating, I try everything because I need to be able to advise my patients. Protein is what we call gluconeogenic. Your body can make carbohydrates from protein. So if you're not aware of what you weigh and weighing and measuring all your ratios of food, you have a little too much extra protein, your body's gonna make sugar, you're not in ketosis, you're doing a modified Atkins diet, and we all know what happened to Dr. Atkins, right? He died of heart disease from following his own diet. So, with stuff like that, you have to wonder, does the diet that says, eat no fruits and vegetables, does that sound healthy? I mean, say, say, no, think about that. A lot of people will start swearing in the keto diet and say, really, you think eating no vegetable, no fruit, and no carb, and having a diet that's no fiber? And they're like, yeah, it's true. I guess I am only pooping once a week. That's not great, is it? No, it's not great. So again, this can be effective and it's popular because everybody's looking for this magic bullet. They're looking for this magic answer. But you know what's interesting? I want you guys to think about your workouts for a minute and your physical activity. Do you ever look for a magic answer and a shortcut for that? No, that never happens. You know, especially with the army, you guys want to do the hardest thing. You want to do push-ups till you puke. You want to run till you can't feel your legs. You would never ask your senior, like, you know what? Do you have a pill I can take instead of doing the last 20 push-ups? Because I'm kind of looking for an easier way to do this. No, you would never ask for a shortcut. <laughs> One thing, yes, sir, may I please call another? But it's funny to me that in the military community, we're 
that you would work so hard in your workout, want to do it the hardest way possible, you know, be so militant about everything, and then the food comes along and you're like, oh, is there a quick way I can do this? Can I just do shakes? Can I just do a protein shake and call it a day? A lot of people don't want to put the work into their food, but it goes hand in hand with your workout. So again, you already have the skills to do this, it's just taking the mindset from the workouts and putting it over to the food. Did you have any other questions about keto? No, I was going to ask you for any input on the uh, blood type diet. <laughs> There's like these diets out there that are like eat right for your blood type. And they're just trying to sell you something. I heard that the uh, SoCal community is doing it. They're like their nutritionists are doing it. But they're I know those. They're, yeah, if they're doing it, it's... It's kind of like saying that like some unit may be doing keto. I don't think it's the SOCOM dietitian that's doing it because I know those people and yeah, that's, yeah we, we coordinate with them. So yeah, eating right for your specific blood type. I haven't seen any convincing evidence that that's something good to follow. Yeah. Well, what about like intermittent fasting? So that's, an, that's another good question. So everybody has a different definition of what intermittent fasting is. What's yours? How, how have you heard it being done? Uh, it's, I eat for four hours after 20. After I 20. Work out okay. So when you are only eating once a day and trying to get all your food in once a day, that's how sumo wrestlers like to gain weight because they're trying to slow down their metabolism. So your metabolism stays active if you don't, if you do, when you're up and around and being active, mostly at least every five to six hours, eating a little something to kind of keep you burning. So a lot of times your metabolism can slow down if you're only eating once throughout the day because from the body's perspective, it's like, oh wow, food is a little scarce right now. So for some people, because it is so drastically different than what they were eating before, they're gonna see some weight loss I don't see a benefit to doing it, especially for very athletic people. Like for people who work out twice a day, it's your eating has to be much more regimented than even working out once a day because I'm working for recovery for the next workout. So again, people are trying to make it easy, but like anything else, it, anything worth having is not easy. It takes planning, but it can become easier with time. Most, if you think about it, most of us have the same several breakfasts, several lunches, dinners, and snacks that we rotate through. We just kind of have to figure out what those are for you, right? And then you have this arsenal of meals and snacks that are your go-to things. Hey, what do I pack with me? What do I eat at this restaurant? And that's what dietitians are here to do. We're here to take a guesswork out for you to kind of get you that list of what are my breakfast, lunches, dinners, and snacks when I'm traveling, when I'm not traveling, if I'm just in the barracks, if I'm you know, eating just at a chow hall and I don't, I'm not even able to buy food for myself, we can help with all of that to sort of demystify some of the things and help with that middle ground. So again, some people, like they love that, I'm only gonna eat for eight hours of the day, but you have to ask, is that really realistic? So if I get up at four in the morning, does that really mean that at eight hours later, what does that mean that I stop eating? Like, what if it's a crazy day? Again, especially, you don't know what's gonna happen. You might have to work light, your blood sugar drops, you get headaches, your brain is not functioning very well. So sometimes it's not realistic for people who are working long and unexpected hours with how you feel and can feel lethargic. Yes? Is that bad for you to send your body into ketosis? No, because if you still had carbohydrate with what you were eating, you're not going into ketosis if you have adequate carb. And again, if you're eating pro too much protein, your body is gonna make the carb out of that. The ketogenic diet actually has a medicinal use. I don't know if you guys know that. We do use it clinically for one thing. There are children who can go on the ketogenic diet who have epilepsy, and it can, for some of those kids, it can cure their seizures. It's pretty amazing. But for the parents, I can't tell you how hard it is because you think about as a parent that you're worrying is, gosh, what if I got the ratio off and my kid had too much protein and they're out of ketosis? Something about the ketone bodies in the brain help to stabilize things. We don't know really quite the mechanism. But again, it's very different for a child to say, you know what, the pros outweigh the cons here. For a few years, we're gonna give them a super high fat diet, no carb, and we're just gonna do the best that we can because it's more important to try to deal with the epilepsy and not as concerned about some of the heart health or GI concerns about having no fiber. So the Charlie Foundation, if you Google that, you'll see a lot of support groups for the parents that are doing this. So that's the original keto diet and where all those recipes were developed so these poor kids could have something to eat at a birthday party and not feel like they were left out. So these fad diets, they come and they go and next year people are gonna be excited about something else, but there's no substitute for hard work, okay? If any of these diets really worked, wouldn't we all look like supermodels? 
I mean, if you think about it, for everybody who went to the doctor who was overweight, they would be like, oh, we just go on a keto diet or this diet or that diet, and no one would have a problem. Our disease would go away and we'd all look like fitness models. But again, people still struggle a lot because a lot of these diets just don't work long term. Yes? Is there anything we can do to increase our metabolism on our ATP? Yes. Like so as, as far as promoting a really good metabolism, it comes down to your schedule. Are you getting up and eating often throughout the day and not going longer than five, six hours without eating, okay? Making sure that you are well rested, getting enough sleep is very good to keep things charged. Keeping good muscle mass, putting on a little extra muscle mass can give your metabolism a boost as well. So it's, a, it's more about kind of structure throughout the day and taking care of yourself and getting enough sleep and getting enough rest to help keep things going. And then if you are trying to lose weight, doing it with a slight calorie deficit and not this drastic cut of the food that you're eating. Those are very good questions. Yes? So I did for like, for a month I did keto. Okay. And then for the next like two and a half months, I did intermittent fasting, time to keto. Mm -hmm the 16-8 method, mm -hmm. and I've lost 31 pounds in three and a half months. So again, when, when you look when you look at that, that's a lot of weight to lose very rapidly. Yeah. Sometimes that's hard on your heart. Sometimes it's hard on your organs. Some people who experience a drastic weight loss end up getting gallstones as a consequence that's of it. Right what, so yeah, the losing weight very rapidly. Yes. Sometimes you, you look at a number on a scale, the scale's not telling you how much of this was muscle mass that you lost. So sometimes a lot of muscle mass can come on with that. So it's not to say that it can't happen, but drastically like that, those are the next questions that we worry about. Like, is there a heart health concern? Might you start developing gallstones? Did you lose muscle mass and strength from that? So the, yeah, these things can be very effective, but kind of slowing it down is gonna minimize the risk of other things happening like that. And then again, PCS, deployment, whatever, and you kind of stop thinking about it. Often people regain that weight and then a little bit more. So every time they do this weight cycle, and that's not to happen to everybody, but we see it, that sometimes over the years of this up and down and up and down, there's just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more fat cells that get created, which make it harder, longer term, to keep that weight off. So again, getting getting rid of that, the ups and downs, like you, you know when your weigh-ins are, right? And people, sometimes people come to my office six weeks before a weigh-in, and I'm not going to be able to help you lose significant weight healthfully in six weeks. So again, if you, if you walk around in a body weight that you're comfortable with, you're, you never have to worry about that coming in. When it comes to, to gaining weight and like putting on muscle mass, also please be aware, it's not like you know I have some ladies that are pregnant and think, oh, I'm eating for two right now. Sometimes I have that, I've worked with bodybuilders in the past or people that really want to put on significant muscle mass and they have it in their head, like, oh, I'm eating for two now. Any extra weight that you put on that goes above, you know, any extra calories coming in that goes above what your body needs to make muscle repairs and to grow muscles is going to get stored as fat. So that's why sometimes I see people get really good and really strong, they build a huge muscle, but like, have you seen some of the professional power lifters? Yeah. What is their physique like? Yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're not always like the most cut people because they're just eating and eating and they don't really care about what extra fat comes on with the muscle. They're just caring about the muscle and all of that. So um, I know we kind of got off track a little bit. The last thing that I'm going to leave you guys with is the role of exercise with weight management and all of this since we're talking about that right now. The most efficient exercise for weight loss is going to be more cardio. So a lot of times I have people that are doing like 80% weight training and 20% cardio. It, you gotta flip that. Start doing much more cardio and you do weight training, you know, to keep, keep your muscle tone and all of that, especially if you do some type of circuit training that gets your heart rate up while you're working your muscles. You guys have heard that HIIT training, the high intensity interval training? That's not a fad, that is actually based on a lot of fact. If you can spike your heart rate up during your cardio, it is the most efficient for calorie burn, okay? You create a really large afterburn, so that after the workout, with that recovery, your body is really metabolically active and burning a lot of calories in recovery from that workout. So anytime that you can do more of that, it's gonna be extremely helpful. Have you guys ever read like a magazine article that talks about, well, if muscle burns more calories than fat, that I should put on muscle first, and then I'll lose, be able to lose more fat mass because my body needs more calories. Have you ever heard that? So that's, I like to touch upon this because I read that a lot. This is where real nutrition 
and theoretical nutrition are going to diverge. Oftentimes what I see is people just care about putting on the muscle mass, they're eating whatever they want, all the testosterone because they're lifting so much and they're super hungry. Now they're all swole and proud of themselves and we have to go on this diet where we start cutting calories. That's very hard once you've been eating a certain way and used to a certain amount of food and now we're taking that away for the calorie deficit and now we're changing your workout up <coughs> they often lose a little strength and a little muscle mass, and then they're depressed because they spent all that time putting on the muscle mass, and they're just hungry all the time. So in theory, it's a great idea. But the reality of what I usually have athletes do is say, let's get to a body fat where you feel really comfortable at. We'll work on a calorie deficit, or you know, we're gonna get half my master's is in exercise physiology, so I get very excited about talking about this stuff. We, we can work on our cardio to get our body fat to where we want it to be, maintaining good muscle tone, muscle strength, muscular endurance, and then we'll start to reasonably add some extra calories in, extra 500 to 1,000 calories a day, along with the right type of workouts so that we're eating just enough to maintain muscle growth and muscle repair without going overboard. Because as much as I want to promise that slow weight loss means somebody won't lose any muscle mass, I can't promise that. And we can try to reduce that risk, but typically sometimes people see a little bit of a drop in muscle mass. So it's a lot easier to kind of just think, okay, I'm just getting my body fat to where I want it to be, and then I can work to rebuild, helping to keep the appetite under control. So I have a lot more success doing it that way. Yeah. Uh, so what you're talking about earlier, we were like really big, and then we try to adjust that. So I'm like, we're talking about letting like, people bulk and then fat and then bulk and then fat. Yeah. It's just, it's just hard once you get used to eating a certain way and you're not kind of caring about the calories and then we have to start reducing portions and things. It's very difficult for people's appetites to adjust and they just feel hungry and cranky all the time. It's also important for your, your workouts and your eating to be timed well, okay? A lot of times people start waking up in the morning and anybody PT in the morning? I PT in the morning, yeah, yeah. Um, over at the gym here early in the morning. You guys are all very motivating for me. <laughs> I, I prefer working out at a Navy gym when people don't wake up in the morning <laughs> and it's less crowded. But um, a lot of people wake up in the morning and they haven't eaten anything. And they're working out doing very heavy cardio on an empty stomach. Now they call it breakfast for a reason, you're breaking the fast, right? All night, their liver glycogen has been running out, that storage form of carbs in the liver is empty because it's been keeping you alive with reasonable blood sugar at night. Then you wake up, and you start PPing really hard and you have no fuel. It's not to say you can't have a good workout, but if you're doing hard cardio, you're not reaching your potential. A lot of people get very afraid because they say, oh, I'm gonna feel sloshy, I'm gonna feel kind of gross if I eat anything. So the goal of sports, this is where sports nutrition and weight management nutrition are gonna completely differ because we have different goals. <coughs> weight management is all about keeping things in my stomach longer, satiety, I wanna feel full. Sports nutrition is get it through the stomach as quickly as possible to get my blood sugar up and stomach empty. So even having a cup of unsweetened applesauce, right, when you get up in the morning, it's gonna wake your body up, turn, you into, turn your metabolism on, efficient calorie burning, simple carbs, easy to digest, get your blood sugar up, ready for exercise, empty stomach, easier for you to hydrate to get that water in, yes. What about a pre-workout? What's in your pre-workout? <laughs> so if so remember, protein is protein is not a fuel, okay? A lot of times I have people mix whey protein and water and they start working out. Remember, high intensity cardio <coughs> is burning carb, is fuel, protein for recovery. Caffeine is one of the few legal and effective, we call it ergogenic aids, a performance enhancer, lowers perception of exertion. So a lot of those pre workout stuff, they're not FDA regulated, okay? So a lot of times there's crazy stimulants in there. Throughout the years, I can't tell you how many soldiers, airmen and sailors have been kicked out of the service that I've seen because they bought some pre-workout, post-workout, something on a GNC, popped for something, and then they try to say, well, I bought it on the installation. You're like, really? We don't believe you, or we don't care. So you take a risk anytime you put something in your system that's not FDA regulated. I do iced coffee in the morning. I'll brew it the night before. I'm gonna chug that with, I do, I do a little dry cereal personally, because I like cereal more than the applesauce and give myself about 45 minutes before I start working out. Some people will do a handful of pretzels. That's simple, get a little extra sodium to hold on to that water so you don't dehydrate. So there's some very easy things that you can do to turn your metabolism on, you have some fuel to work out, and then again, you wanna eat, 
within about an hour after your workout. So it's kind of like switching it. Instead of doing a breakfast and a mid-morning snack, a little snack right when you wake up just to turn your body on, and then breakfast is your recovery. Because I can't tell you how many times I have people with weight management goals that get out of the gym, they make some giant smoothie thing for recovery, and then they go eat breakfast. And I'm like, this is not a way to save calories. You're, if you plan your meals as pre-workout, post-workout recovery, they're much more filling and give you better recovery than a lot of those supplements. <coughs> because again, growing on the cellular level, the colorful fruits and vegetables, plant sterols, phanols, phytochemicals, are gonna hit that recovery on a much different level than just your carbs and just your protein. It doesn't sound really cool to be like, yeah, eat fruits and vegetables for recovery, like it sounds cooler to take a pill, it sounds cooler to have a protein powder, but they're just not as effective. And I can't tell you how often I'm in the gym, somebody's had a workout, some big heavyweight training workout, super proud of themselves, mixing their whey protein with water, and they're like, oh yeah, bro, hungry. And I'm like, okay, I'm not saying anything because again, yeah, nobody's asked me, but when you just chug, protein by itself without anything else after a workout and expect recovery, kind of like dumping a bunch of bricks on the side of the road and sitting there and wondering why is my house not being built. They haven't hired anybody to do anything. Carbohydrate signals that anabolic response. You ever heard of that? The anabolic building response. Insulin comes out, it's a hormone, it's a hormone that your pancreas makes after you've eaten carbohydrates, okay? so. You need that to tell your body what to do with the protein. So having, again, balanced nutrition of saying, am I getting at least 20 grams of protein and at least like 25 grams of carbs here so that they can work together for recovery. And now if you have another workout later in the day, you want the storage form of carbohydrate in your muscle to get maxed out again as a form of fuel. So having adequate carbohydrate right after you work out with the protein and a couple hours later will help to fuel if you have higher intense exercise later in the day. Does that make sense? Uh, if I have time for one more thing, just a tip about hydration. Hydration is what's usually missing as far as strategy for sports nutrition in most people, okay? Try to weigh yourself before and after your workout. You should be within 2% of your starting weight, okay? If you sweat out more than 2% of your body weight, However cool often your workout was, you cannot reach your potential physiologically. Because once you start dehydrating like that, things start to break down. You burn through your fuel sources faster, right? You don't want to do that. You want to have fuel sources go slowly because the, if you spare that fuel, you can work out harder and longer because you have more fuel. You don't feel tired as often. When you do that, your core loses the ability to thermoregulate and cool down. You just get tired faster. You're at risk for overheating. So, a lot of people forget about hydration. So for a 150 pound person, they can only lose three pounds during a workout before they have compromised their athletic potential. I weigh a lot less than 150 pounds, but if I'm not paying attention, I could easily sweat out five, six pounds after a workout. So some people like to see that number on a scale go down, but it, it's just water. They haven't lost any fat mass, and all that means is you did a bad job hydrating. <laughs> so sports drinks have a role, Typically, if you're working out outdoors in extreme heat for about an hour and you're not, and you need to make sure that you keep your blood sugar up and electrolytes up, a sports drink like a Gatorade or a Powerade can be very powerful to help you do that. Coconut water is not an effective sports drink. They market it as it, but it's not. It does not have adequate carbohydrate. It does not have adequate sodium. But let's say you are weight conscious and you're like, hey, I would, I'm having trouble with my hydration. I don't really care if it's not the best time of the workout. I just want to feel good. I don't want to feel tired. There are those little um, electrolyte tablets that you can dissolve in water. So I often do that. I take spin classes over at the gym. And so that is just going to help replenish mostly my electrolytes. It's not going to give me extra carb. So there are options like that, depending on what your goals are. Sports drinks are typically used for ultra endurance athletes. I used to run triathlons and marathons. So when you're working out for 90 minutes, for sustained cardio, that's when those things can be very effective. For most of the time, your pre-workout snack and water are ideally supposed to fuel your workout, and then eating you know, something small and balanced with the carb and the protein about an hour after the workout will give you the best recovery from that. So this is why a lot of these ultra-low-carb diets are just very hard for people who want to do intense cardio. 
because their fuel stores in their body for that three body cam store some carbs, they're not going to max out. They're going to be lower. And so it's much harder for them to maintain the high level of Ready for the test? <laughs> so again, this is hard stuff. I could give you like a whole seminar on like two weeks of nutrition. It's a very complicated field. A lot of individual questions and things. But again, this is free healthcare, so please use it. We're just up the hill at the hospital. So because you've come to this class, you can call like the 646 well number and you listen to the prompts for, you know, to get your referral management schedulers and ask to refer yourself to a one-on-one -on -one appointment with dietitians up there, make sure you request a one-on-one -on -one appointment so you don't get put in another class, okay? <laughs> it's very important to specifically request that. If you come with at least a couple days of a food and exercise journal, it's very helpful to be able to get a snapshot of what's going on, what are you eating and what times are you eating. So instead of being like, breakfast, I had eggs, no, what time was it? How many eggs? How did you prepare them? Was there fruit? Was there bread? Was there coffee? What did you add to it? The more detailed you can be, the more that we can kind of look at what's going on and help you and what your goals are. Even if weight management's not a goal and you just have other questions, you can always just come hang out, pick our brain, and ask about other things, because there's always things that people can do to improve their own diet, even if weight specifically is not the goal that they have. And this is about, again, a middle ground. It's not about being perfect, okay? A lot of people think it ha everything that they eat has to be like approved dietitian. It's just about saying, most of the time I'm eating really healthy, and if I want to go out for pizza or Popeyes on occasion, it's not a problem. It's just people go off the deep end, and they'll have days of eating Popeyes and McDonald's mm -hmm. because they keep thinking about it for a very long time. So there's a middle ground. I had, um, I had a patient once, and his downfall was Friday night McDonald's trips. He'd be really, really good, but Friday night would come, go through the drive-thru, and he'd get, you know, two quarter pounders of cheese, medium fry, and a Coke. And I'd say, well, and he's like, I just feel like I'm out of control. And it's very hard for people to admit. Um, there's a lot of eating issues in the military, a lot of emotional issues. And so it was very embarrassing. It was a very high-ranking officer who's having, you know, everything else in his life is perfectly under control. And then this is just an area where he felt like he was out of control, very hard to ask for help. And I said, well, sir, tell me, what are you thinking about when you are going into the drive through What are you looking forward to most? And he's like, honestly, fries. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm getting the two burgers and the Coke, really, just because I'm there. And I said, well, novel concept, just go get the medium fry and then bring it home and have it as your carb with the dinner and then have a stir fry or this or that with it. So it's a whole new concept of saying, like, yeah, I can go out and bring McDonald's fries home and have something else with it. Like another patient I had, it was Wendy's chicken nugget that had a problem with them. You always know, got like five or six orders to try to feel full. I said, well, what if you got one or two, brought it home, you can chop it up and put it in a sandwich, put it in a salad, do something else with it. So it's not all or none. Get out of that mentality, because again, just because you want to eat healthy, those temptations don't go away. If you keep them as you know, forbidden fruit, no pun intended, that's likely when the binge happens because you're just restricting yourself rather than thinking, I gotta live with this food around me. How can I work it into my plan? And again, that's what we're here to do. Yes. Um, earlier when you were talking about the basal metabolic rate. Yes. Um, I think I've done something like that before then. I took something up and measured it. Did you have something like that on Ali? We had one. I don't know if we still do have it. I'll need to check. I've only been here for a few months. So these are usually called metabolic carts where you fast and you don't have any caffeine for three hours prior to coming in. They hook you up to this mask and this tube and you just breathe normally for about 15, 20 minutes or so. And by inputting like your age and your weight and measuring the rate of your oxygen consumption to what you're going out with CO2, it's a cool process that they can do a pretty accurate, me you know, indirect measurement of what your metabolism is. We have for math formulas that most of the time come really, really close to that. On occasion, I see someone who runs a little bit higher, a little bit lower, and we adjust it. The good, I mean, it's great knowledge to have, but at the end of the day, I don't need that to treat somebody. Let's say I have you on a lowish calorie diet and you're not losing weight. Well, obviously your metabolism is a little lower than that, so we're just gonna bring you down anyways. So it's, it's cool to know, when I would do it with professional athletes, a lot of these different measurements were important to know because it had a lot to do with like calculating fuel usage and stuff like that. So, but that was a whole different game that even then he didn't really need to know it. It's just kind of 
run to know it as well. So, but again, in the military, remember, different body types and different stuff have different benefits. Some of my colleagues are this SEAL team dietitians out in San Diego. And what's interesting, a lot of the guys that go there to the program have it in their head that what they want for their percent body fat and what they want for their muscle mass, and the dietitian has to sit down and talk to them about what the ideal body is for a SEAL, and it's not what they go in there thinking. Dietitians sit down with them and they say, you know what, you, what you idealize is way too low body fat than what's healthy. Because if you get dropped in a jungle and can't eat for two weeks, I need you to have some reserves so you can survive. So again, it's just interesting to think about, again, that what you envision might be perfect for this military thing might actually be not be perfect depending on what your job is and all of that. So there are different ways to be healthy. There is a range of body types. So, Well, thank you guys so much for inviting me here today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for yeah. coming, ma'am. Please just uh, give us a call if you want to come visit. Oh, yeah. I'm calling. It's on the second floor, right? Yes. Yes. Well, that's correct. We can bring our well, spouses and stuff out to you. Yeah, the more people you can bring that are involved. Oh, yeah. in the yeah. 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 So it's where you guys are trying to be jailed. Back to their house. All the children that are involved. All the children that are involved. You and the kids as well? I'm going to be here in the morning. All right, hey.